Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to this series on the Armenian historical tradition. If you were with us last week, you'll remember that we mentioned two major incursions into the wider region in the 11th century that brought fundamental changes to Armenian life. The first was the Seljuk invasions and conquests that following upon the Byzantine eastwards expansion in the beginning of the century, mark the end of Armenian autonomous rule over the major portion of their historic homeland. The second was the coming of the Crusaders and the consequent shift in the balance of power brought about by their military campaigns and new principalities. During the disruptions of the 11th and 12th centuries, there was a significant migration of Armenians westwards, first into Byzantine provinces like Sebastia and Cappadocia, then northwards into the Crimea and Northern Black Sea coast, and southwards into Cilicia along the northeastern Mediterranean sea coast and Taurus Mountains, where the Kingdom of Cilicia was established at the end of the 12th century. Last week, we focused our attention on two historians, Aristakas of Lastevert and Matthew of Edessa, who responded to this changed world, looking to bring meaning out of misfortune. We made a case for the wisdom of Aristarchus, who urged his readers not to fall prey to the easy temptation to view themselves as innocent victims, to blame God or fate or the evil of men or external forces, but instead to focus their attention inward, to take responsibility for the ways in which they contributed to their own downfall to humbly return to truthful, upright, and honest ways of living and being in the world. Not to worry about what's outside their control, but to focus all their energy and attention on improving what is in their control, which is the surest path to improving one's life in the world. In this week's lecture, the Medieval Armenian Chronicle, the rise of a new, old genre, we will examine the rise and flourishing of a subgenre in Armenian historical writing that became very popular at this time and over the following centuries, the Chronicle. So what is a Chronicle? Well, the English word Chronicle derives from a Greek word for time, chronos. And you can see on the screen here, the Greek terms from which the Armenian relevant terms are derived. So chronos is jamanag, time. Chronographia, the Armenian jamanaga krutun, which is chronicle or chronological record. And then one who writes such a thing is a chronographos, jamanaga kir, chronicler. So to put it simply, a chronicle is a record of past events arranged according to the calendar year, thus chronologically. Perhaps the most influential precursor or model for Armenian chroniclers was the fourth century chronicon of Eusebius of Caesarea, a work we've mentioned before. A massive undertaking that survives fully only in Armenian translation in two hefty volumes published in 1818. The Chronicon was a world chronicle that stretched from Abraham until Eusebius's own time, which placed side by side the major events and figures of different peoples by era and year. Last semester, we talked about the influence this had on the first book of Moses of Horan's history. Now, we should not draw too sharp of a distinction between a chronicle and a history. There is a certain degree of overlap between the two forms, but let's see how we can make a tentative distinction between the two for present purposes, at least. First of all, let's remember that story and history, which we distinguish in English, is just one word in Armenian, batmutun as in other languages, such as Italian, storia. 
As we've come to see over the course of this series, the Armenian histories are stories. That is, they are narrative compositions, making use of all the same rhetorical and literary devices that make a story compelling. They take a past event and making full use of their literary skills, weave together a gripping story that has a purpose, is meant to impart moral knowledge to the reader and instruct and inform them how to act in the world. They may proceed chronologically as most stories do, or they may not, manipulating time and events so as to fit their primary purpose, which is to offer readers wisdom and moral guidance. Yerishe and Razar's narrations of the religious conflicts between the Armenian Christian nobles and Sasanian Empire are a great example of this. Chronicles, by contrast, adhere to the calendar year as their fundamental organizing principle, proceeding in an organized and methodical fashion and narrating the major events that happened in a given year wars, natural disasters such as famine or plagues, the change of political leaders and other such events deemed worthy of record by the chronicler. It is often a more unadorned presentation of past events, one of whose primary purposes is simply to keep a record of what happened at what time. Chroniclers, of course, will often have their own biases, larger purposes and intentions but these are often hidden below the surface or left more implicit than is the case with pre-modern historians. It is, not un, it is not uncommon for histories, for historians, excuse me, to make use of chronicles in order to craft their story or history, but it would be rather unusual for the opposite to take place. Up to now in this series, we focus primarily on histories, always attempting to examine and explain what the author's purpose was in telling their particular story. Our focus on histories has been motivated not just by the fact that they are usually more interesting and compelling than chronicles, and thus better suited to a lecture series like this. They certainly are all that but also because there are hardly any Armenian chronicles before this period. Then, seemingly all of a sudden, in the 12th and 13th centuries, there are a significant number of chronicles written. So here you can see on the screen on the left side, in the 12th century, there's Matthew of Edessa's and then his continuer, continuator, Greek or the priest, who we looked at last time. Samuel of Ani and Mechitar Ghosh also wrote a short chronicle. And then in the 13th century, Mechitar of Airivank, Mechitar of Ani, Sambat Asparabed, and Hetum. And we'll look at those latter two uh, later. Chronicles continue to pace well into the 18th and 19th centuries. A publication in the 1950s by an Armenian scholar V. A. Hagopian. He published a large two volume collection of minor chronicles, Manar Jamanaka Krutuner, written between the 13th to 18th centuries. Let's look just at the contents in Armenian to get an idea of just how many there were. So here's the contents, and these are actually links to that'll take you to the text online. So I know it's nearly impossible to read. Um, you're not meant to read each one. The list is meant primarily to impress and overwhelm. Notice if you can uh, see at all, how many of them are anonymous. Ananun. This is a common feature of chronicles. Some are also the work of multiple chroniclers composed over generations. Many of these are quite brief and some were composed as colophons, uh, the scribal notes attached to the end of a manuscript in which the scribe took advantage of the opportunity and remaining blank pages in the manuscript he was copying to record events that took place in his time. So these are manaj, minor, 
or brief chronicles. But there are also, of course, more lengthy ones from these centuries. A few such later chronicles have been translated into English, some by the late George Burnutian, who translated many of the most important sources pertaining to Armenian life and society in the early modern period. You can see on the left, the Chronicle of Deacon Zakaria of Kanaker that was written in the 17th century. And then these two on the right were both written in the 18th century. The Chronicle <coughs> of Abraham of Crete, and then on the far right, <coughs> the Chronicle of Bedros de Sarkis Givanens concerning the Afghan invasion of Persia in 1722, the siege of Isfahan, and the repercussions in northern Persia, Russia, and Turkey. So before returning to the 12th and 13th centuries, uh, where our focus will be, let's take a brief look at the Chronicle of Deacon Zakaria, since we have it here. The Deacon Zakaria lived in the 17th century and was a native of Kanakir, who lived and wrote in the great monastery of Hovhanavank in the Kasal region of the Khanat of Yerevan. Um, and the monastery is shown in the picture on the book cover. So his chronicle treats the political and socioeconomic conditions of the region in his time, describing the Ottoman Safavid wars of the first half of the 17th century, the reigns of different Persian shahs, the Muslim Khans who ruled over Yerevan at that time, and Armenian ecclesiastical events and controversies in the second half of the 17th century. Since one of our themes has been the continuity of the historical tradition across time, let's observe how this 17th century writer opens up his chronicle. And notice how he refers back to the earliest histories of the Armenian literary tradition when he comes to write his own. So this is book one, chapter one of his chronicle, the history and succession of the Persian kings. He says, my wish was to bring to light the history and succession of the Persian kings and their times, but I do not know their origin. The famed secretary of Durdat, Agathangelos, the Latin, and the great Movses Horanazi state that the history of the Persian kings began with Arshak the Parthian and ended with Ardavan. They have enlightened us with their colorful and vivid histories. I have borrowed from their works and have included the information here. I hope that your wisdom will assimilate my small contribution into your own vast knowledge. After the death of Alexander of Macedon, and it takes off from there. So just to point out how um, this writer all the way in the 17th century is looking back to Agathangelos and Movses of Choden uh, to, um, to, to uh, create his own record of the past. So coming back now to our period, the 12th century, a question naturally presents itself. Why the explosion of chronicles at precisely this time? First of all, we should note that the chronicle was a very popular form of medieval historical writing in general, especially in Greek and Latin. In fact, there's an academic society and research journal devoted solely to the scholarly study of medieval chronicles, mostly focusing on the Latin ones. And the 11th and 12th centuries are a time in which Armenians experienced renewed and increased interchange and engagement with Christians from the West, both from the Greek and Latin traditions. It's therefore not altogether surprising that Armenians, along with their increased contact with Greek-speaking Romans and Latin-speaking Franks in this period, came to also utilize the popu this popular form of historical writing. But this is not a sufficient or fully satisfactory explanation for a culture only adopts what it deems useful and applicable to its present concerns and needs. 
Armenians were not simply going along with the times or following literary trends for the sake of being up to date and fashionable when they began to write chronicles. So we should look for a deeper reason. Remember that up until the 11th century, histories were generally sponsored by a noble Naharar patron because they had a because that patron had a particular story that they wanted told in a particular way, whether to enhance their own standing or to influence the way in which they were perceived by their contemporaries and future generations. Remember also that in the 11th century, the Naharar societal structure was disrupted to such an extent that Aristarchus, who we looked at last week, could find no patron to sponsor his work. Thus, in the 12th century, when Armenians were picking up the pieces of their fragmented and dispersed collective self, they confronted a world that must have appeared to them to be chaotic, lacking leaders, lacking a center. Where to turn to for structure and order? Well, there is perhaps no more fundamentally organizing construct to human perception and experience in the world than that of time. Built as it is on the cyclic structure of the seasons and the movements of celestial bodies. Composing a narrative built on the structure of time perhaps offered a way of bringing order and clarity to a fragmented and chaotic world. In the absence of a single empire or state in which they were living, particularly one ruled by Armenians, the construct of the annual year, the calendar, may have served to bring a sense of cohesion to the Armenian collective experience, which lacked any political center and also a stable ecclesiastical center. Adopting the form of the chronicle was of course not entirely an innovation, but something that also could be seen to connect Armenians to their tradition and past, something which is very desirable in a time of chaos and flux. As they looked back to Eusebius's Chronicon and Movses Hordonazi's first book. There is yet another related reason. Traditional Armenian society, like most traditional pre-modern societies, maintain their collective memory and connection to the past through rituals around sacred sites and through oral and literary storytelling, much of which took place under the, sponsors, under the sponsorship of the noble lords who ruled the land on which such rituals took place and in whose courts such stories were recited. With the disruption to the Naharar structure and the dispersion of the Armenian population, there was fear of a loss of memory and meaning, since the institutions which vouchsafed collective memory and meaning making were disrupted, in flux, or removed entirely. Let's recall that the ecclesiastical center was also disrupted, something well illustrated by the mobile and peripatetic career of the 11th century Catholicos Grigor Vagayaser who was constantly on the move. The Catholicate was then eventually also settled in Cilicia, outside of the traditional Armenian homeland. So we could also interpret the generation and proliferation of chronicles in this time as a reaction to the endangered state of collective Armenian memory. The chronicle with its faithful record of events often made with little comment or larger meaning attached, was a way of collecting and recording the past such that memory would not be erased. We could compare this and see an even more pronounced echo of this same impulse in post-genocide 20th century Armenian literature and society and the far more dramatic dislocation and dispersion that came as a consequence of genocide. In, in that time, there's a proliferation of memorial books, Husha Madian, and annual books, Dare Kirk, which aim to create a written record 
of a lost past in order to preserve the memory of life before the catastrophe. So now that we have this understanding in mind, let's say a few words about some of the chroniclers in this period and look at a few examples from some of their texts. So returning to the 12th century, um, there's Matthew of Edessa and Gregor the priest we talked about last week, and we'll read some selections tonight. Uh, then there's Samuel of Ani. Uh, he's the author of a chronicle down to the year 1180. And this is one of those ones that was continued by continuators uh, all across the generations, all the way down to 1776. And a recent edition of that has just been published uh, not too many years ago. So that's a very common feature of chronicles is for them to be group efforts where kind of each succeeding generation just adds to them to bring them up to date. And as far as I know, I don't think that text has been translated. At least I couldn't find it. Uh, Marie d'Argoche wrote a very short chronicle. Um, he was a very important figure, um, which uh, we could say a few words about. So he wrote, he lived in the 12th and early 13th century and stands at the head of the Eastern or Albanian Al Alban school of Armenian writers. So these include himself and two of his pupils who we'll look at in future sessions. Vartan Adavelci uh, and Vanagan Vartabed, and uh, Giragos Gonzakatsi. So these are all located in the region of what is Artsakh uh, today, Caucasian Albania. I'll just briefly say a couple words about Mahidar Ghosh. So he was a very important figure of this time, uh, both for his own works and because he was the um, head of a monastic lineage or Bartabed lineage that included uh, two writers we'll look at in future sessions, Vartan Adavelci and Giragos Gonzakatsi. Um, so he, all of these writers are part of a so-called like Eastern uh, school of writers or um, these are ones who lived in essentially the the region of Caucasian Albania, which is essentially Artsakh today. Um, so this is an area where um, Armenian life was less disrupted than it was in the other areas further west. Um, so he traveled to Cilicia. And if anyone knows anything about Mekhitar Ghosh, you usually know that he wrote a law book, the Dadastan Akirk, which is essentially the first written law code in Armenian for Armenian civil society, as opposed to like ecclesiastical law. Up until his time, uh, lay law, like civil law, had been largely oral and customary, um, kind of ruled by the, the noble lords who ruled each particular place. Um, and just as an aside, it's, it's beneficial for law to be oral uh, when you're in charge, because you can kind of change it as you like. <laughs> but so again, it's another um, consequence of the disruption of traditional society is now you write it down uh, because you don't have that same situation anymore. Uh, so his very brief chronicle is translated in the article cited on the PowerPoint um, by Charles Dowsett, who, if you remember, was one of the ones who translated the history of Caucasian Albania that we looked at last semester. So Mahidar Ghosh's chronicle essentially contains a list of Albanian patriarchs complementing and supplementing that which is found in the history of Caucasian Albania and deals very briefly with events in Caucasian Albania from about 1130 to 1162. Okay, so since we gave Matthew of Edessa rather short treatment last time in our focus on the Seljuk invasions and Aristarchus' response, and since Matthew of Edessa stands at the head of this subgenre, being essentially the first writer of a chronicle at this time, 
Let's look at a lengthier passage of his, looking at how he describes the coming of the Crusaders to the Near East. So Matthew of Edessa is a very sophisticated writer. Far from being a sparse record of events, his chronicle is very stylized, a very stylized account, not differing too much from the tradition of Armenian historiography that he knew well and drew upon. So let's notice in this passage, in his description of the coming of the Crusaders, how he makes use of apocalypse and prophecy, devices that we saw in previous historians such as Lazar, Sebeos, and Aristarchus. So in his entry for the year 1096, he writes the following. In these times, there was fulfilled the prophecy which had been told to the Naharars and princes of the Arvid Mersas, Catholicos of the Armenians in the fourth century, about the rise of the Romans. What that blessed and wonder-working man of God, Nerses the Great, had prophesied at the time of his death in days gone by was realized in these present times and witnessed with our own eyes. It was the same vision seen by the blessed Daniel in Babylon, where he saw the form of a strange beast, which he clearly saw and revealed details about its chewing, eating, and trampling the remainder. In this period, the rise of the Romans occurred, and the gates of the nation of the Latins was opened. This was because the Lord wanted, through their agency, to war against the house of the Persians. It's kind of a collective word for Arabs, Persians, Turks, kind of anyone that's Muslim. The Lord turned from his anger, according to the words of the prophet David, who said, Arise, why do you sleep? O Lord, arise and do not reject us forever. And the Lord arose from sleep like a strong man who puts aside his wine. He threw back his enemies and made them accursed forever. So it came about in this year that many nations were on the move, all Italy and Spain to Africa, and the distant nation of the Franks swarmed in a countless and immense multitude, like locusts which cannot be counted, or like the sands of the sea, which the mind cannot reckon. In awesome grandeur and high-ranking leadership, there arose and came princes of the Franks, each with his own troops, coming to the aid of Christians and to save the holy city of Jerusalem from the foreigners and to free from the Dajiks, Muslims essentially, the blessed sepulcher which had received God in it. They were glorious men and kings, adorned with faith and all piety, nourished in good deeds. Here are their names. Godfrey, a mighty man, from the line of kings of the Romans, and his brother Baldwin. It was this Godfrey who possessed and had with him the sword and crown of the emperor Vespasian, with which he had destroyed Jerusalem. Back in the first century. Also arriving were the great count named Bohemond and his sister's son, Tancred, the count named St. Giles, an awesome, glorious man, Robert, Count of Normandy, and also another Baldwin. Subsequently, there arrived the count named Jocelyn, a mighty and valiant man. Such mighty and martial men as these came with an immense multitude, as numerous as the stars in the sky. Along with them came many bishops, priests, and deacons. With much labor, they traveled through the distant land of the Romans, and with wicked trouble, they passed through the land of the Hungarians, through the narrow and difficult passes of their mountains. They arrived at the borders of the Bulgars, which was under the rule of Alexius, emperor of the Byzantines. With such traveling, they reached Constantinople, the great city. Um, <clears throat> so here you see his very um, <laughs> kind of excited description of this coming. Um, now let's look at how he uses uh, specifically apocalyptic, uh, focusing on or employing these kind of like celestial occurrences to set up his description of the conquest of Jerusalem. So this is a device that's borrowed from the apocalyptic genre 
whose purpose is to indicate God's involvement in the events to follow. So in the entry for the year 1098-99, he writes, In this year, for the second time, an omen appeared in the northern part of the sky. In the fourth hour of the night, the sky was inflamed more than the previous time. It turned an intense red color. This began in the evening and continued through the fourth hour of the night, and it was an awesome omen never seen before. The color rose up like a tree with veins of color filling up the northern part and ascending to the heights of the firmament, while all the stars took on the color of flame. Behold, such an omen is an omen of coming anger and destruction. In the year 548 of the Armenian era, which is 1099 to 1100, a normal eclipse of the moon occurred, which also had that intense red hue and which lasted from the first watch until the fourth hour. Then it turned a black color, while viewers also could see the bloody red. Because of the intensity of the blackness, all creation was darkened. Savant said that there would be bloodshed from the Persian nation, as the moon above them showed, according to their books. So again, meant to show God's hand in what's to follow. In this year, the army of the Franks went against the holy city of Jerusalem in fulfillment of the prophecy of Nerses, the Armenian patriarch, who had said, the salvation of Jerusalem will come from the nation of the Franks. Yet due to their sins, it once more will fall into the hands of foreigners. Now it happened that when they were en route, an army of foreigners came to war upon them, just as the Amalekites went before the children of Israel in battle. When the crusaders reached the city named Arkah, a fierce battle with the foreigners took place there, and the troops of the Franks defeated it in great triumph. The army of the Franks advanced peacefully and reached the gates of Jerusalem, where they engaged in many battles. At that time, Lord Bahram, patriarch of the Armenians, was in Jerusalem. The troops of the foreigners wanted to kill him, but the Lord preserved him from their clutches. After much warfare, the Franks erected wooden towers and brought them close to the city walls. With great violence, the sword and power, they captured the holy city of Jerusalem. It was then that Godfrey took the sword of Emperor Vespasian and attacked the foreigners with all his might, killing 65,000 of them in the temple and also killing other residents of the city. In such a fashion was the holy city of Jerusalem taken and the sepulcher of Christ our God freed from taxation to the Dajiks. So this uh, total and complete uh, bloodbath is presented <clears throat> in a very positive uh, way by Matthew of Edessa. And we have to remember that this is also related to the fact that the Armenian lords who migrated to Cilicia and set up strongholds in the Taurus Mountains took advantage of the new situation to form marriage and political alliances with the new power on the scene, the Crusaders. So they benefited significantly from crusader presence. The two Armenian clans who became most dominant in this period were the Rubenids and Hetumids. As you all know, they were able to establish a principality in Cilicia, then through the help of their military, political, and marital alliances, the reigning Rubenid prince Levon was coronated with his new kingly status recognized internationally. And for more on all of this, you can see the lecture series, A Slow Transition to Cilicia, offered last year by Dr. Roberta Irving, that's available to view on the St. Nurses YouTube channel. So this coronation of Levon allowed local Cilician Armenians to celebrate the return of Armenian kingship, even if it was removed from the traditional homeland of the Armenian plateau. So let's look at how two chroniclers of the 13th century mark this notable event. So first, King Hatim II's Chronicle. So this is a great example of how 
laconic and sparse uh, the descriptions can be in certain chronicles. But this very brief chronicle was written in the late 13th century and covers the years from 1076 to 1296. It provides information about individuals and events associated with the rise, ex expansion, and collapse of the Cilician state. And an English translation by Robert Bedrosian is available online. So the title in the manuscripts is quite interesting. It's a brief history compiled from various sources, namely Armenian, Frankish, so Latin or kind of French Latin, Greek and Syriac historical writings by myself, Hatum, Lord of Kodikos, servant of Christ God in the year 745 of the Armenian era. And this is typical of Cilicia, the writers there were, it was a time of great exchange and interchange with other local cultures. Uh, many, many translations were made at this time from Syriac, uh, Arabic, Greek, and other languages, Latin especially. So as mentioned, the entries in this chronicle are extremely brief. So <clears throat> here's the entry for 1197, the year of the coronation of Levon, the first king of the Cilician kingdom. You think it's going to be marked with, you know, great fanfare. So 1197, start on the left in the Armenian. Baron Levonen Basagatsav Takiv, Yevyagats Arachin Takavor Ikilikia. Yev is Jibetan Tavov Arin Hanorinats, Melik Hetlin Ar I Christoneids is Jofen. So Baron Levon received coronation with a crown and became the first king in Cilicia. They seized Jibet with force from the infidels. Melik Yedl seized Joff from the Christians, probably, I guess, probably Joff, Jaffa. So we shouldn't, and that, that's all that there is. But we shouldn't interpret this sparseness as implying that the event was not considered a big deal in Armenian eyes. This sparseness is simply due to the chronicle form. So by contrast, if we look at the chronicle of Simbat Spadabed, we can see how he makes a big deal of this event. So he, Simbat was the brother of King Hatum, uh, a statesman and general in the newly formed kingdom of Cilicia. Uh, his chronicle was translated by Robert Bedrosian and has recently been made available in the Sofene books series with the Armenian on one side and English on the other. So about three quarters of this work summarizes Matthew of Edessa. Um, and Simbot's original contribution runs from the years 1163 to 1272. So let's see how he introduces Levon as a character and then describes his coronation. So Levon's character. In the year 1187, Reuben died and his brother Levon ruled the principality. He was a benevolent, ingenious man without a grudge toward anyone who took his refuge in God and guided his principality accordingly. He was a wise, brilliant man, a skilled horseman, brave-hearted in battle, with attention to human and divine charity, energetic and happy of countenance. And these two episodes really emphasize his might um, right before he's going to become king. So in the year 1193, when the Prince of Antioch had returned from Saladin, um, he plotted with his wife to seize Levon. She said, do not work such an iniquitous deed because he is my son-in-law and always serves you gladly and assists you in military matters. But the Prince of Antioch did not abandon his wicked plans and sent summoning him. Levon arose and went to Bavaros, and the prince's wife secretly informed him about the plot. Levon sent to the prince, asking him and the princess to come to him at Bavaros so that he could honor them, and then they could go to Antioch together. They came willingly, and Levon went out before them to honor them and bring them into Bavaros. 
Then Lavon seized the prince there and had him confined in the citadel at Cease, carefully guarded. So he's a very strategic and intelligent uh, person. Then in the same year, Sultan Saladin, so this is the great um, Arab uh, conqueror and ruler who retook Jerusalem for the Muslims and unlike the Crusaders, didn't slaughter the population, uh, kind of let them go. In the same year, Sultan Saladin sent an emissary to Levon, telling him to give the country of Cilicia to him and he himself could go away unharmed. So you have the greatest general of the time, Saladin, writing to Levon saying, you know, give me your territory and I'll let you go off free. Levon was frightened and did not know what to do. But placing his faith in God, he said to the emissary who had been sent to him, tell the Sultan that I have no country to give you, but, if the, but that if you come to my country, I will give you a double-edged sword to swallow, as I did to Rustam, your co-religionist. So as provoking and taunting uh, as you could get. When the Sultan heard this response, he growled like a lion and prepared his forces to come to the country of Cilicia to exterminate the believers in Christ. He came as far as the Black River, where he then became ill and perished. His son named Malik Zahir sat upon his throne. And outside of this chronicle, there's no evidence whatsoever for this event ever having taken place. Um, and it doesn't seem that Salad Saladin had any intention of invading Cilicia, nor did he die on the way to doing so. But such an episode, uh, you know, really heightens Levon's kind of might and strength, you know, right before he's going to become king to defy the greatest uh, ruler of the time. In the same year, on May 16th, the Catholicos of the Armenians, Lord Grigoris, passed to Christ in the land of Cilicia and was buried at Drazark. His throne was occupied by the son of his sister, Lord Grigoris, who was called Vahram and was still a lad. In the same year, a number of noble princes died, sons of the sister of the Catholicos Hatum, the son-in-law of Levon and his brother's daughter, Alice, and Hatum's brother, Shahanshah. The uncle and the nephews died in the same year. It was said that Levon was the cause of their deaths, but only God knows the truth of the matter. So he may have been clearing out the way for himself to arise above his um, relative contenders, but <clears throat> as Sambat said, only God knows the truth. So now let's look at how he made use of marriage alliances with uh, crusader families in order to bolster his position. Now, when Levon had seized the prince, that prince of Antioch from before, he put him into confinement for some days. When the royal prince, Henri, came from Acre, he requested him as a favor from Levon, and Levon granted it to him. They established a covenant of friendship and marriage relations with each other, as Levon gave Alice, the daughter of his brother Reuben, who previously had been the wife of Hatum, Shahanshah's brother, in marriage to the senior son of Prince Raymond. This was done with the provision that should the union produce a male child, he would be Levon's heir, and that after the death of his father Raymond, he would be the Lord of Antioch. This was agreed to by oath and in writing. The prince's son was with Levon and went about with him, but he died after a while. His wife was pregnant from him and gave birth to an appealing and comely boy. Since Levon had no son, the child was to be the heir of their patrimony. He had him nurtured with great attention. He was baptized and called Reuben. And this is very typical of uh, the marriages and the um, kind of makeup of the Cilician Armenian kingdom, which really was kind of like a merger kingdom of Frankish crusader families and Armenian families. Often the wives were of Europe, 
Europeans. And so now he receives his crown. So in the year 1196, the Byzantine emperor sent Levon a noble crown and sought an alliance of friendship with him. Levon received the crown with joy. In the year 1197, Levon sent to Constantinople the archbishop Lord Nerses, son of Oshin. This is Nerses Lambronazzi. And the very noble Prince Halcom, brother of Bahuran, his mother's brother. They went and gladly demonstrated to them Levon's disposition for friendship. Since Lord Nerses was a wise and learned man, adorned with every virtue, the Byzantine sages gathered around him and conversed with him for many days about the Armenian confession of faith and appointments of the church. Lord Nerses brought them to willing acceptance. In that same year, there was a deviation concerning the proper day for commemorating Easter. How surprising. <laughs> In the same year, Levon sent the Archbishop of Cis, Lord Hovhannes, to Acre about the crown which the king of the Germans had sent to him with the troops which had come there. An archbishop had also come by order of the Pope of Rome with Celestine III. And now the great ceremony. In the month of January, in the year 1198, I think it was on January 6th, on, on Christmas Day, uh, from other sources. Yeah, or here it is. On the day of the revelation of the Lord, Theophany. They anointed Levon, king of the Armenians, in obedience to the Church of Rome and the emperor of the Germans. And there was great joy among the Armenian people, since they saw their lordship restored and renewed in the person of Levon, a moral and God-loving king. And note, of course, how it says, in obedience to the Church of Rome and the emperor of the Germans. So, um, you know, again, it wasn't like it was an independent uh, kingdom, but nevertheless, it um, provided for the restoration of kingship and standing and uh, many other things for Armenian society there. In the same year, Lord Nerses, son of Oshin and brother of Gostan, Lord of Lambron, died. And now we should briefly narrate some things about the pleasing modern events occurring in the house of the Armenians. For Levon was a learned, brilliant man with a happy mien and a generous soul toward all. He might have killed all, the, all his relatives, but that's beside the point. Toward the clerics and laity, the poor, the weak, and to those in monasteries and retreats, dispensing his goodly gifts everywhere, celebrating the Feast of Holy Week with great assembly and a costly table. Whenever he learned that a man was found suitable and capable for a particular job, he sent and called him, giving his word, and when he had been brought, Levon recompensed him with generous gifts. All the ranks of the clergy and the honored princes were adorned and comely in this country of Cilicia. Let me record their names one by one. And there follows a long, long, long list of the high-ranking um, ecclesiastical figures and the princes of this time. And um, so you can really see how important of an event this was for kind of restoring and renewing uh, Armenian society here. By means of this event, Armenians could herald the return of kingship, which was visually depicted in coins like the following, which the Cilician kings minted. So this is a coin from uh, the first king, Levon, uh, who we just read about. So look on the front, the side on the left. It says, Levon Takavor Hayots, Levon, King of Armenia. And note how um, he's seated on a throne and there's two lion heads emerging from the throne. So Levon is Leo, lion. That's what his name means. And notice how he's holding a cross in his right hand and what's in his left hand? The fleur-de-lis, the French royal symbol. And on the back side <clears throat> uh, is the lion. So his kind of figure uh, as an animal with a cross behind it. 
And it says in the Armenian, by the will of God, the by the will of God, King of Armenia. And there's also wonderful images of manuscript illuminations of the Cilician kings, like these two on the screen. So on the left is King Levon II, who reigned 1269 to 1279, and Queen Karen of Lombrum. And on the right is a depiction from some years later showing them with five of their children. They eventually had 16 children. And then uh, Queen Karen, after the birth of their last child, she retired into a monastery, become a nun, <laughs> which you can understand why someone would do that after having 16 kids. So every calamity brings with it the promise of a new beginning, the opportunity to start afresh, to build something new and great out of the burnt ashes and dead bones of the past. It will not be the same as what came before, but that does not mean it won't be good or noble or beautiful in its own right. The princes and lords of the mountains of Cilicia took the broken fragments of their sacred and traditional past and constructed something beautiful there. And they had their chroniclers to record the events. Great scribes and artists like Todos Roslin and Gregory of Skevra to illuminate them. And great writers like Nersas of Lombron and Nersas Shnorhali, who wrote works of poetry and wisdom that will last for all time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arlen. So we will now have a few minutes for any questions that there may be here. Please feel free to enter them in the chat feature. And we have from Matthew Sarkisian, are there aspects of Crusader histories that are only known to us today through Armenian chroniclers? Yeah, certainly. Um, when, whenever historians look to, you know, tell the history of a time, they want to gather all the sources that are produced. Um, because as we've seen all throughout this history, you know, each source writes from their own perspective with their own preoccupations, which may or may not, usually are not the same of the modern historian trying to reconstruct the past. So um, Matthew of Edessa in particular is extremely important and highly regarded by uh, modern historians today as especially one of the earliest sources um, on the early period of the coming of the Crusaders. So there's a number of uh, Latin works and Greek works and Arabic works and Syriac that talk about these events and um, scholars use them all. And the Armenian sources are considered very important for the history of this time. And we have from Avi Gold, the Chronicle seems most conducive to writing about the present. What might be a motivation to using a Chronicle format for describing events preceding the time of the Chronicle, if there are such examples? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. So you, you definitely see both. And even in uh, like, uh, literary criticism writers, you know, of the past, like in Latin, who are defining chronicles and what they are, um, they define them in, you know, one person will say, a chronicle is written about events preceding one's own time. And then another person will define it as a chronicle is written for events that occur in the person's own time. Uh, so the complete opposite. 
and you you definitely see both. So one one example of the one for the format of one preceding the events of the chronicler is Eusebius of Caesarea's Chronicon. So he goes all the way back to Abraham and uh, puts together side by side the in in order by year or era um, events pertaining to uh, you know ancient Rome. Uh, Israel, Babylonians, Assyrians, Egyptians, uh, and others. And then he stops at 325. And at 325, or a little bit before that, starts his ecclesiastical history. So his other great historical work. Um, And so he, at least for one, viewed the Chronicle as kind of what takes place before, and now I'm gonna write a history. Um, But most of these cases, these later ones are events that happen in the chronicler's own time that he wants to make sure to record. And then they might become the basis of a later writer's historical work. Um, So I think it must be, what's the motivation to make a chronicle for events preceding the time is, at least in Eusebius's case, it was kind of to set up his own history or put his own history in the line of what's coming, what came before it, and thus connect it uh, with what came before. Uh, and I think you see the same with some of these other works. So some bots who um, he could have, he could have, you know, just on his own time, but he wanted to lead up to it. And uh, so he summarized Matthew of Odessa's just to sort of provide something brief and then added um, recorded things for his own time. So it must be just to kind of give extra context for what you're gonna describe. Thank you. And from Suren Israelian, is the overall image or the facts about King Levon in foreign sources different from the Armenian sources? Yeah, um, of course, in the Armenian sources, um, his accomplishments and stature is presented in as flattering and kind of uh, dramatic a way as possible. Uh, In foreign sources, he would appear as kind of a minor uh, figure on the scene. And then another significant thing is that he and also some of the later figures if you read, you know, from the Latin sources, yeah, he's Armenian, but, or they're Armenian, they're perceived as Armenian, but they're also considered like kind of belonging to us. So especially over time in the Cilician kingdom, there's a kind of like, you know, Francification or kind of greater and greater assimilation or uh, whatever into kind of like Frankish crusader Uh, styles of dress, speech, uh, language, to the point, as you likely know, the last uh, crusader king died and is buried in, I think, Paris, somewhere in France. Um, And so in the Armenian sources, they're going to highlight more um, matters that are particularly meaningful to, you know, traditional Armenian uh, society of norms for kingship and these sorts of things, where in the Frankish sources you get an interesting picture of like, you know, how these how this figure appeared to in the eyes of others. And from Christine Domburia, what do other country chroniclers from Syria, England, Byzantium, etc., say about Armenians? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, And of course, a very broad one, um, which I I don't think I could have anything like too meaningful to say about the time, but Armenians are generally looked on um, fairly favorably in uh, Latin sources, um, European ones, because they were especially helpful as allies uh, at the time. Um, 
then again, there's always a lot of tension in Greek and Latin sources because uh, often over ecclesiastical differences, Armenians not wanting to give up, wanting to hold to their rituals and theology and their way of practicing the faith and not wanting to do it the way the Latins and Byzantines were trying to impose upon them. Um, and I'm sure there's a good study on just that question. I know there is for like earlier periods, um, but it's certainly a very interesting thing to look at Armenians through the eyes of uh, other sources. And here's a language question from Matthew Sarkisian. I noticed in the text that some of the Western names written in Armenian seem to have Western Armenian pronunciation of the letters, um, Robert, Franks, Baron, etc. Is the pronunciation change already occurring at this time or was it earlier? Yeah, so it definitely had already occurred by this time. And the proof you have of that is exactly what you pointed out. So all the names are written according to Western uh, pronunciation of the consonant shifts. So baron like, is barren, you know? So you might expect if you're thinking classical or kudapar, like, okay, so you'd use a ben, um, eit ben gin. But no, it's according to Western uh, pronunciation, I pen uh, kim. So the b is the be. Um, so baron is written with the bay. Um, so yeah, that had already occurred essentially from pretty much as far back as we have manuscripts, which is around the ninth, 10th century, um, from pretty much as early as you can go back to have evidence to check some such things. There are spelling mistakes based on the fact of Western Armenian um, writers being confused over the spelling of letters, just like happens in schools today. Um, so some people even think that going all the way back to the fifth century, there already could have been um, this pronunciation shift that had taken place. Of course, um, the literary language that was formed as Kudapar in the fifth century was based on the dialect of essentially Ararat Valley where um, the kings were, the royal court. And so um, it could be the case that a pronunciation change had already happened then. Certainly by this time, uh, it had for the Western portions of Armenians. And we have what is, I think, a, a wonderful question to end with tonight from Suren Israelian. Can you give us a teaser what you will cover next Thursday? Yeah, I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're going to look at the Eastern historians. So uh, Vartan Adavelci and Girogos Kansakatsi. So these are ones who lived in, so we did kind of more Cilicia today. So these are in the far eastern parts of where Armenians lived. Uh, Vartan Aravelts even means, you know, Vartan the Easterner, uh, because they lived in essentially Caucasian Albania. And uh, their histories are really interesting. It's uh, in, by that time, the Mongols have already come and are on the scene and they kind of deal with that um, as well as some of the other histories. So. We'll probably do that next time. Please join me in thanking Dr. Harlan for another wonderfully interesting, riveting lecture. Um, join us again next week at the same time, same place. And also be aware that the first lecture from this series has already been uploaded to both the St. Nessus website and the St. Nessus YouTube channel. So if you missed last week's session, you can go back and see it. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Stay safe, stay warm, stay healthy. Good night.